So this is, uh, this is um, John, the book of John, chapter six. Let's open our Bibles to chapter six, book of John, Jesus the God-man. Today, uh, the title of our lesson today is uh, Jesus' Two Promises. So this is, uh, as I say, lesson number 13. We're almost at the halfway mark. <laughs> Something uh, unusual that we will uh, have done here. I believe there are 30 lessons. Don't let that discourage you. But for all those who said, you know, I wish we had a really in-depth study, line by line, took our time. Well, this is it. This is, that, this is that study that we're doing. The study of Jesus' divine and human natures as described in the book of John. So for those who may be new to the class, I want to say that in our initial study of John so far, we've seen this kind of cyclical pattern of teaching, two cycles actually, uh, we call it a, you know, a, a wheel within a wheel. There's the, um, there's the cycle of Jesus revealing His divinity uh, through a cycle of witness, teaching and miracles. Over and over again we see Him revealing Himself as being divine in various situations, in various ways. And then there's the larger cycle of events that begin with Jesus revealing His divinity in some way and then watching people respond to Him with faith or with disbelief. This cycle again continues throughout the book. And then of course we've noticed a familiar pattern of steps that Jesus uses in His personal evangelism. We had a class on that a little while back uh, showing how Jesus, you know, what His approach to personal evangelism was, and I think it was a great, uh, obviously a, a great example for us because we can kind of copy the same steps today uh, in our effort to reach others. So let's keep our eyes open for these particular features in John's Gospel as we uh, forge ahead with our study. Now in our last lesson we did chapter five, we saw Jesus perform a healing miracle and then we saw the response of belief uh, or first of all disbelief from Jewish religious leaders who were bent on destroying him and his ministry. Imagine witnessing a miracle and, and feeling threatened by that miracle to the point that you want to destroy the person who's done the miracle. Uh, pretty amazing stuff. So in rejecting this great evidence of his true nature we saw Jesus rebuking them and warning them. Remember last week we said you, you know uh, Jesus warns them there are a lot of ways to lose your soul. And these people here were demonstrating all the different ways that an individual could lose their soul. Dishonor for God, lack of preparation for the judgment. You know, we forget that this life is preparing us for the judgment. For those who are in Christ, there is no judgment. But a lot of people are not ready for that, for that day. Hard-heartedness, not, not hearing the word, not allowing the word to penetrate you. Uh, ignorance of the word, you know, imagine if ignorance is no excuse for human law, can you imagine, do you think you can get by on divine law? Like I didn't know, nobody told me? No, ignorance is not a, an excuse. Uh, pride of course and uh, disbelief itself. The greatest accusation that the judge, the divine judge is going to make will not be, oh, you lied, or oh, you committed adultery, or oh, you committed murder. The worst accusation to face is, you didn't believe. With this tremendous amount of evidence, you did not believe. That's the, it's worse than murder. Worse than, you can come back from murder. You can repent of murder if you've done, but if you disbelieve, there's nowhere else to go. You know, you've burnt the last bridge. So in our lesson today, we're going to move on to chapter six, Jesus once again returns to Galilee, performs two great miracles. This time he makes two promises to those who believe. You know, instead of listing the dangers of disbelief, in chapter six he's going to talk about promises made to those who do believe. So let's go to chapter six and begin reading, shall we? It says, uh, chapter six, after these things Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This 
he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves and having given thanks, He distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish as much as they wanted. When they were filled, He said to His disciples, gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves which were left over by those who had eaten. So both Philip and Andrew demonstrate that there is no possible way to feed the people with the resources that were at hand. They don't realize that with Jesus they have the resource or the source for meeting all needs, not just, not just food. In Colossians 1 verse 16, Paul says, for by Him, meaning Jesus, for by Him all things were created both in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. So the one who creates the invisible things, you know, creating a visible thing like bread is, not, you know, is certainly not impossible. So the miracle is that from five loaves and two fish, Jesus feeds 5,000 people and there are 12 baskets of bread crumbs left over. The lesson, of course, is that with Jesus as the source, there's always more than enough. You know, if you're going to draw a lesson for any age, for children uh, to the, the, the oldest seniors, when Jesus is the source, there's always more than enough. So we continue reading verse 14. It says, therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, this is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by uh, himself alone. So note the reaction of the crowd. They see Him as a Savior and as a Messiah of sorts, kind of, sort of. Not the one that He is, but the one that they want Him to be. They want Him to be the one who's going to provide all their needs. I mean, what a, imagine if your, your leader could produce all the stuff that you needed miraculously. You know, what if our president at the moment could do miracles and you know, produce all the things that we needed. Free health care. Anyways, we won't go down that road. <laughs> I'm not going to mention his name because somebody watching this video in 10 years from now may not know who we're talking about. But anyways, let's, let's keep going. So they want to force him to be the king. Their view of the Messiah was that he would have great powers. You know, the, the Jewish mindset at the time saw the Messiah as someone who would come and deliver them from their worldly enemies and make them a great nation again. They wanted to go back to the golden period of Solomon, where the, you know, the, the temple was a thing of beauty, where the, this small nation had great military strength, economic power, respected by the nations around them. They saw the Messiah when He would come as someone who would lead them to that status. So Jesus, you know, He knows their hearts, he doesn't want to be this type of king for them, and for good reason. I mean, only God anointed kings, and so their anointing would be meaningless. It doesn't matter, if, you know, in, in, in a theocracy, unless God anoints you as the king, it doesn't matter who elects you. Um, they saw him as a man. They saw him, yeah, a superman. Wow, a prophet who can, make, who can do miracles, but they just saw him as a man and they wanted to put their plan for political redemption into action. Jesus was, not sent to put, uh, Jesus was, not, was sent to put God's plan for spiritual redemption. They, they may remain slaves to Rome, that wasn't what Jesus came to do to break free of their slavery from Rome, He came to help them break free of their slavery to sin, but they didn't, they didn't understand that. So Jesus needing to uh, stop the mountain of their, momentum rather, of their actions, he leaves for solitary prayer. As God, some people say, you know, why would Jesus pray? As God, he didn't, he didn't need prayer, he, he was God. But as man, however, he needed to pray for the Father's will to be done despite this setback. This miracle was a great miracle, but it was a setback because now the people kind of 
you know, know Him and begin to perceive Him in an incorrect way. So that's the first miracle. So let's uh, uh, talk about uh, the miracle itself. It says, now when evening came, His uh, disciples um, went down to the sea and after getting into a boat, they started to cross uh, the sea to Capernaum. It had already become dark and Jesus had not yet come to them. The sea began to be stirred up because a strong wind was blowing. Then, when they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus walking on the sea and drawing near to the boat, and they were frightened. But He said to them, It is I, do not be afraid. So they were willing to receive Him into the boat, and immediately the boat was at hand, uh, excuse me, the boat was at the land to which they were going. So this miracle is performed only for the apostles this time, uh, and those of us who read their, their testimony. Both miracles prepare the people, the apostles, and all who read uh, as a witness uh, for what is next about to come. So we have the great miracle of the feeding of the 5,000 for the masses, and then we have the miracle smaller, in, well not the miracle is smaller in scope, but the audience, only the apostles see him walking on water. There's always a purpose for what God does and Jesus, there was always a purpose. And the purpose was to prepare them for what He was going to do next. So Jesus declares His divinity. I mean, in, in doing the miracle, who else could walk on water? You know, but He declares it now in a more concrete way. So we keep reading in verse 22 to 27, it says, the next day the crowd that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boat there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with His disciples into the boat, but that His disciples had gone alone. There came um, other small boats from Tiberias near to the place where they ate the bread after the Lord um, had uh, given thanks. So when the crowd saw that Jesus was not there, nor His disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came to Capernaum seeking Jesus. When they found Him on the other side of the sea, they said to Him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek Me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you, for on Him the Father God has set His seal. So notice in these events that the smaller cycle of Jesus declaring His divinity in various ways will work within the larger cycle of people observing these things and react with faith or disbelief. So you got the small circle, miracle, teaching, witness, you know, pointing to His uh, divinity, larger circle, uh, 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 people believing and, and observing or disbelieving and observing, believing and observing, disbelieving and observing. So the multitude follows Jesus. It's not a huge lake, but much too large to walk around in one evening. It's about 40 miles around the, the Sea of Galilee. So they know he, he couldn't have walked it uh, you know, uh, overnight. There was no boat to take him across. They knew this, so the only conclusion walking across on the water somehow involved the miraculous. That was the only conclusion that they could, they could come to. They didn't see it, but all the signs pointed to the fact that he had done this. And so Jesus now confronts them about the miracle of the previous day. He's given them a night to sleep on it. Think about it. Now he's going to talk to them about it. He says and reveals their true motives. Their true motives was free food. You know, I, I, I belong to this group that's kind of discussing different ways to help the church grow. And somebody in that group says, well, you know, this other church over here, you know, they have uh, uh, TVs, they have a show, they have, uh, you know, they have a band, uh, they've got all kinds of things, draws a lot of young people, blah, 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 blah. And I said, hey, if we put up on our sign, you know, $100 to every visitor, $100 cash to every visitor, no limit. Every time you visit, you get 100 bucks. You think we'd get visitors? I think so. I think there'd be plenty of visitors. Uh, plenty of visitors. There might even be some of our regular people who become visitors. <laughs> That's a whole other thing there. But you, you know what I'm saying. Sure, there are methods 
that will reach a certain objective or conclusion. But of course, our challenge as Christians, as New Testament Christians is, will our strategies be based on the Bible? That's the point. Uh, what we do has to be based on the Bible. So their faith was not in Him as the divine Messiah, their faith was free food. Wow, we we'll follow this guy because he's giving us food for nothing. You know, every leader, every political and military leader in history knows that lesson. If you give people what they want, they'll follow you, they'll, they'll vote for you. He reveals what their methods should be. Never mind the food, he said, look for that food that gives you spiritual satisfaction. God provides spiritual nourishment only through Christ and the proof, you know when he says the seal, that's the proof. The proof that this is so is the miracle that filled their bellies. He filled their bellies miraculously so that they would see the larger picture that he could also fill their spirits as well. So with the miracle of the loaves and fishes, Jesus proves that he can provide the spiritual nourishment that only God can give. He's the source of that. And so now we read in verse 28 the reaction of the crowd. They say, therefore they said to him, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? So the people misunderstand his statement thinking he can give them some sort of secret formula that will give them the power to make bread. They still don't get it. They say, well, okay, if you don't want to do it, give us the power to do it. We'll make our own bread. So in this way, they confuse spiritual food with spiritual signs. They couldn't grasp what he was trying to offer them. Not food for an empty belly, but an opportunity to fill their souls by opening their eyes. And you know, let's not be too hard on these people. Unless you've, you've grown up sort of, you know, grown up in the church, Bible school when you were like three years old and you just grow, grew up, you can't remember what it was like when you were not a believer, but I can. Some of us maybe can. I, I, you know, I was baptized when I was 30 years old, so I remember a life without faith. I remember what it was like to be a non-believer or not care about spiritual things. And, I, and, and I, I can't be too hard on these people because when I was not a believer and I would hear about Christians or read something about Christians or met somebody who was a Christian and they were talking about their faith, to me it just sounded like blah, 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 you know. You know the first thing that, uh, that entered my mind was avoidance. Avoid at all costs. <laughs> Run away, religious person, you know. So I, I get it. I get that they could see something great and just you know, they not be able to grasp it because you have to have the spiritual mind to grasp spiritual things. Jesus is saying to them, in order to have that mind, you need to come through me. And that's very, very through, true for those of you, like I say, who were converted at an older age, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So what's Jesus' response? Verse 29, Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in Him whom He has sent. So Jesus goes ahead by explaining the purpose of the miracle, to create faith in Him as the Son of God. The miracle is an example of how God promotes faith. He doesn't eliminate choice, He simply provides proof. You still get to choose, but He provides the proof. In the end, all men choose to believe, but God provides the proof necessary to influence that choice. And God, in His perfect wisdom, knows just how much proof to give not to override free will. I mean, if He wanted to, He could zap us, bring us into the third heaven, show us angels, and you, know, you come back down to earth. <laughs> you know. But He doesn't do that. Just enough proof to, um, to maintain our free will, that it is a choice. So if we choose to believe and continue to do so, we demonstrate God's work and influence in us. Our faith, not our great or miraculous works, is what demonstrates God's power working in us. I don't have to show a miracle to show God's power working in me. You just have to have known me when I was 25 and know me now, and I guarantee you, you, you would see the power of God's word working in an individual. And I guess the only person who knows that is my wife, Lise. 
All right, verse 30, 31. So, they, so it's back and forth, this dialogue. So they said to him, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written, he gave them uh, uh, bread out of heaven to eat. Do you believe these guys? I mean, he's just performed this fantastic miracle, and based on that, he says, look, this miracle I just did is to help you believe in me. And then they say, well, what sign do you give us? You know, we want more, more proof. In essence, they demanded another miracle to convince them to believe. And the miracle they wanted wasn't one like that. They wanted an old time miracle. You know, like the stars, like the sun stopping in the sky. That type of miracle. You know. Manna from heaven. That, they wanted that type of miracle. You know, Moses provided manna for 40 years, they said, so do the same or do better, then we'll believe. They want miracles in the style of Moses. They want better miracles than Moses. Now this is just another way of refusing to acknowledge who Jesus really was based on the witness of miracles, based on the witness of teachings and, and declarations He's already made to them. The more He tells them, the more He does, the more they want uh, greater signs. So, the point here is, when you don't want to believe, no amount of proof is going to change your mind. No amount of proof will change your mind if you just do not want to believe. What the Hebrew writer says, those who come to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. So Jesus refuses to be their human king because He's their divine king, and they need to understand this. Now, he doesn't deal with them on their terms, but on His terms, and salvation is based on their recognition of this. All right, Jesus' response. Jesus then said to them, truly I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread out of heaven, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. So the Lord corrects their misunderstanding of both Moses and manna. Moses never gave the true bread from heaven, which is spiritual life. Only God can give this. Manna never came from heaven. It was described as that, but it, they never saw it falling down from heaven. It simply appeared on the ground in the morning. Manna had three purposes, if we want to kind of you know, digress a little bit. One, it was to feed the physical appetite. Two, it was a witness of God's power. And three, it provided a type or a preview for the true bread that would come from heaven and give spiritual life. So he keeps, you know, he keeps on to going to witness his divine nature by teaching them concepts that only God can know. Who, who could know about manna other than God Himself who gave it? And Jesus is giving them further insight into the whole miracle of manna. So now the crowd responds, 34. Then they said to him, Lord, always give us this bread. You notice they, all they're interested in is food. Give us more food. Okay, give us the power to make food. Okay, give us food forever. Okay, now give us the manna that, you know, it's all about food. It's all about feeding the physical appetite. Notice that they address him as Lord. You know, they said to him, Lord, that's sir. That's a polite way of saying sir. It, it's not the word savior. You know, in English we, tra we translate the, the Greek words into the word Lord all the time, but if you go back to the Greek word, sometimes they, it meant sir, like a term of respect to a teacher or an elder, and then other times it referred to the savior. Here they're still talking to him as a teacher. They see that what he is offering is desirable, but they still don't understand what it really is, and they don't believe in him. Before, they wanted power to make bread in a miraculous way. Now they think that the true bread is some kind of super manna, where if you eat it, you won't ever be hungry anymore. Just a better way to satisfy their physical appetite. All right, we go back to Jesus. Verse 35, he says, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. So Jesus stops speaking to them in parable-like terms, clearly defines, clearly declares His divine nature by linking Himself to the divine image that He's been describing. Throughout this chapter, He has declared this same idea in different ways. He said, 
Uh, he was the Messiah that came into the world, verse 14. He said He was the Son of Man, verse 27. He said He is the one on whom the Father has set His seal, 20, verse 27 as well. He is the one sent by the Father, verse 29. He is the Son of God, verse 32. He is the one who gives life to the world, verse 33. And He is the bread of life, verse 35. I mean, how many ways can He say it to them? How many images can He present to them that say the same thing over and over again? So first by miracles, then by teaching, now by a clear declaration, Jesus is trying to show them who He really is. And they still don't get it. And so the crowd responds to him. They said, uh, but I said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. So Jesus flatly states after all of this, their response is simple disbelief. Their response is the same as the Pharisees at Jerusalem. They don't believe. He didn't make bread for the Pharisees, but he did show them great miracles. And they didn't believe. To the people, he shows them a great undeniable miracle. They don't believe. So before Jesus explained the condemnation awaiting those who didn't believe, you know, in chapter five, you know, all the, the six ways to lose your soul. Well, even though the, uh, these in, Galis, in Galilee also respond in disbelief, he does make two promises to those who do believe, then and now. And here are the two promises. First promise, acceptance. Those who come to Him will be accepted. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. There's the first promise. All those who come through the cross of Christ will not be refused, regardless of their sins, their nationality, their intelligence, their social position. No matter where you're at or who you are, there is no need for fear. God will accept you through Christ. Now, I go back to my previous example. If you've grown up in the church, you, know, you understand that message you know, intellectually. And if you've been a, you know, a good child and you know, a good teenager, went to the youth group, went to the camps, you know, went to Christian college, married a Christian girl or boy, whatever, you know, and your life is not perfect, but you've had that life, you understand what he says here intellectually. On the other hand, if you have a kind of life where there's been drinking, drugs, wild sex, lies, cheating, violence, abortions, if you've had that kind of life, then this here has a lot of resonance for you. Because if you've had that kind of life, you don't like yourself a whole lot. And when you come face to face with the gospel and the truth of your life, then you're pretty uncomfortable then you really do have some doubts as to, hmm, I wonder if God, I know He can forgive this and that, but this other thing over here, I did it, I wanted to do it, I enjoyed it, I repeated it over and over again. Hmm, can He forgive me for that? Willful, bad sin, you know, can He? Because I'm so ashamed of myself, uh, I'm not sure that He, you know, maybe he'll do it, but he's not happy to do it. Well, you know, if you're that person, you need to read verse 37 and commit that to memory. Accept you, he will accept you. And then the second promise that he makes is eternal life. Those who do believe have eternal life. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of him who sent me, that, all, that of all that he has given me, I lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. What God desires is that none who believe in Jesus will be lost. Can you imagine? God wants you to be saved more than you do. <laughs> you, you want to be saved and you want to go to heaven. Well, you know what? He wants you to go to heaven a lot more than you do. And the proof of it is he's paid a much higher price to guarantee it than you have. Maybe you quit doing all that stupid stuff that you may have been doing, or maybe you're struggling to try to quit some of that stupid stuff, whatever, wherever you are. But God wants to save you. He, imagine the God of the universe wants to save me and you, those who are unworthy. So those who trust in Christ, trust that he will save them despite 
their weakness. Think about that. Notice that first comes the eternal life and then comes the resurrection. You see the significance of this? You already have the eternal life. The minute you came out of the waters of baptism, you had eternal life. You have it. You're living in it. You're existing in it. You, you're, we are, those of us who are Christians, we are existing in the eternal life portion of our life. The only other thing left to happen is to divest ourselves of, of this mortal body so that we can continue in this eternal life in a suitable body, which is a spiritual body, which is suited for the next dimension. Our physical body made from the earth is suitable for this dimension, this physical dimension. Our spiritual body will be outfitted for, it's like outer space, you, know, you wouldn't go to outer space without a space suit. Well, you wouldn't go to heaven with this physical body. It wouldn't work there. But I want us to understand that Jesus is saying, you have the eternal, I came to give it to you. It's not, one day I'll have eternal life when I resurrect. No, 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 you've got it now. Because eternal life does not refer to simply length of time, forever. It also refers to a quality of life. And the quality of life is not like here, a quality of life, I feel healthy, I can run a marathon when I'm 80, that, not that quality of life. The quality of life that eternal life exists in is a life where each day you're waking up cognizant, conscious of the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And because of that, you have this new life. That, that's the bubble, if you wish, that's the framework for eternal life here on this earth that you hope for something that you don't see, that you uh, can experience something that you cannot touch, that you actually believe, like Jesus will say later on, blessed are those who believe but have, have not seen. That's us. We haven't seen it, but we believe it. And because of that, we live in this context of eternal life. Only one step left, get rid of the mortal body, and then we're good to go, as they say, in the military. All right, so Jesus performs two great miracles. He declares that He is the Savior, the Son of God, the giver of eternal life. His audience doesn't believe, even though He has done the miracles and He's made the declaration. They search only for the physical blessings to come. It's like if we were thinking that eternal life is just this life, but it goes on forever. Many religions you know, teach that their, their afterlife experience is just their earthly life, but in a perfect context. You, know, you won't be hungry in your stomach, and you'll always be happy. You know, and uh, like in the Muslim faith, you know, the, the martyrs will have access to sexual uh, pleasure, you know, 72 virgins, all that. You know, it's like this world, but perfected. That's not what we're, that's not the heaven that the Bible uh, describes. But this is the heaven that they wanted. So to those who believe, he makes two promises. He will accept anyone coming to him, anyone, whoever you are, it doesn't matter. Anyone who comes to him, he will accept. And all who come to him will receive eternal life. So, what shall we say? Well, first of all, don't be discouraged by your own lack of faith at times. And sometimes you don't even believe. Even eyewitnesses rejected Christ. Even after eating the bread miraculously made, they still didn't believe. So it's normal to doubt. It's normal for the majority to reject. Even Christ said that the way to life was narrow, few be on it. We need to stop worrying you know, because we're not the majority. You know, when I hear it, the United States is a, you know, a Christian country and we want to you know, be the majority of Christians. That ain't going to happen. That's not going to happen, not because we, our politics is wrong. That's not going to happen because Jesus said the way is narrow. The way is narrow means you're always going to be in the minority, always, always. So don't, don't feel you know, that that's unusual for some reason or other. The other thing I want to say is, when in doubt, remember the promises of whom you've believed. Realize that you have eternal life now. Take heart that Jesus promised that He wouldn't lose any. None. 
If you're in Christ, He will see you through. He will see you through no matter what, He'll see you through. All right, well that's our lesson and our exhortation and a little bit of political commentary for this morning. Thank you for your attention, we appreciate it.